So thanks again to everyone for joining us, but a big thank you uh, to Jeffrey Smith for joining us today. Um, you may know that Jeffrey's worked with Nick Cave. You may know Jeffrey's filmed a man conscious whilst he's undergoing brain surgery. Jeffrey's someone who's been shot at and hit and has obviously survived to tell the tale. Um, Jeffrey's films have won so many awards. It's a guess that his mantle piece isn't big enough to, uh, to, to hold them all. Uh, he's won two Emmys and he's, won over he's made over 25 films. And just some of those films, The English Surgeon is the moving story of neurosurgeon Henry Marsh, who travels to the Ukraine to operate on people there. Uh, Search for a Killer is Jeffrey's own story of returning to Haiti to try and find the person who shot him in the leg. Presumed Guilty is the story of Jose Antonio jailed in Mexico for a murder he didn't commit. And A Father's Story is a film about Ralph Bulger, father of two-year-old James Bulger, who was murdered by two 10-year-old boys. Um, one thing is that you need a huge box of tissues to watch any of Jeffrey's films. Uh, there's not a single one of Jeffrey's films that has not made me cry. And how many filmmakers can you say that about? If there's one thing that Jeffrey's films perhaps have in common, it's their compelling narratives and their gripping stories. So Jeffrey, huge honor to have you here. Um, welcome, and thanks for coming to this event. Thank you, Hans, um, and good afternoon, everybody. It's, it's really very warming to be here amongst fellow storytellers and, and also to be back in dear old Blighty after 10 years away. Um, stories, well, we all know stories have been around for as long as we have and that they're really embedded in our consciousness and way of life and they're rich and powerful because they can be distilled down to a number of shared emotionally led archetypes. And cinema is what can bring all that together. It can intoxicate us with the power of these shared stories because it captures most of our senses at the same time. But I'm fascinated to be consulting on a film where some research coming out of California um, is really throwing some more light on why film stories can reach us so, so powerfully. Um, three diverse scientists up uh, in Northern California have already shown that our brains actually think in narrative sequences and that therefore we make sense of and structure the world through narrative building blocks. But what they've now shown is that feelings come nanoseconds before, but, but basically before any conscious thought about those feelings. And we then, our brains, our conscious brains, construct narratives to justify or explain those emotions. So feelings precede conscious thought. And that's incredible for, for people who work as we do with, with um, images and sound, because in a cinema or when someone's watching one of our films, you know, they have feelings first, and then what, 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 what this science is telling us is that our brains will literally search for a narrative to place that feeling into. So feeling first, then the brain looks for a place to cement or make sense of that feeling through a narrative. And that to me is incredible discovery because it explains and gives new meaning to something we storytellers have always intuitively known. That, that is that cinema audiences will construct their own highly personal narratives alongside our directed ones. So um, that discovery, which as I said, really, really thrilled me, is why we all indeed actively construct our own life story on a daily basis. But now we know that it, we're compelled, we're actually compelled to do that through neurobiological stuff. So it's fascinating. Jeffrey, that's really interesting how contemporary scientific research can, you know, in, uh, impact on, how we make films and how we digest films and how we how we how we um well our relationship with film but if i take you right back what was your own um what ignited your own passion for film um the golden thread of <clears throat> my life story which is really uh, it's nothing special about it but it's just a really useful way to sort of extract meaning out of out of telling stories um i went to film school because uh, I was attracted to other people's stories. And we had this fantastic, really, truly maverick older teacher who used to lock us in a windowless room um, for hours on end. And he would show us um, 
lots of 16 mil avant-garde cinema, a lot from the US. And one of these auteurs that I had the pleasure of spending time with during these cinema lockdown sessions was a Ukrainian American woman, Maya Deren, who I'm sure many of you know, and her magic film, uh, Meshes of the Afternoon. And, you know, I was a, a little suburban boy and I was completely entranced with this film. And I watched all her other work. And then I found out that she'd fallen in love with a place called Haiti and written a book about it called Divine Horsemen, The Living Gods of Haiti. Um, so, you know, as I said, this little white boy from suburban Melbourne um, was plunged into this magical text. And Maya shows her readers how Haitian people make sense of the world through voodoo. But she also really helped me make sense of my rather disconnected reality through meaning and story. Um, and I mean, look, I didn't have a, the happiest of childhoods. I was sort of very disconnected through with myself and my country. Um, but thankfully, due to, to Maya, I sort of said to myself, instead of destroying myself on the drug field streets of St Kilda, I chose to kill that old Jeffrey off and I went traveling. And of course, guess where I went? Um, I fell in love with Haiti straight away. It's a very strange and intense land. And um, despite lots of other experiences in lots of other countries, Haiti so captured my heart that three years later, I, I went back to live there um, and to film their first election in 31 years with some friends uh, who were making a documentary, Haitian friends. And to cut a long story short, on the morning of that historic election, um, we discovered 23 people had been massacred in a school voting station only 10 minutes earlier. Um, and then two of the same killers came back emptied their M16s up the street. Uh, they killed the journalist in front of me getting out of a car and put a red hot bullet through my leg and across my shoulder. It's hard to know what to say to that. What happened next? <laughs> well, look, it's a whole other story. And indeed I made a film about it, but um, you know, uh, fear, adrenaline, endorphins, the kindness of strangers, the embarrassment of having your trousers ripped off in a public A&E, um, and that night, the sort of visceral terror of lying in a hospital bed as the same killers came back and threw grenades over the hospital walls. Um, but that's not part of the story I'm, I'm telling you right now. Um, that thread that I wanted to pick up was, uh, yes, look, there was physical trauma from my own injuries, but the real trauma came from seeing 23 mangled bodies that had been cut and shot to pieces, lying in deep pools of blood on the concrete schoolroom floors. Um, those images, really haunted me for years and uh, I returned reluctantly to England and I was living in a squat down in the Elephant and Castle having lots of nightmares about this guy, um, this killer um, chasing me and like I think I don't know four years or something it was a long time um, but I finally got the courage to confront myself and um, uh, although I'm not recommending you try this at home, um, being shot was seriously the, and honestly the best thing that ever happened to me because I was forced to ask myself some serious big big questions you know look uh, I said to myself if I died from that random bullet fired by a random stranger what was I going to leave behind who was Jeffrey Smith what what could I now do knowing how fragile life was and they're great questions to have to ask yourself So when you did return and you and you you made the film searching for the shooter, in what ways was that a cathartic experience for you? Um, I'd heard about this BBC strand called Video Diaries um, from some of the people I was hanging out with in London, and it, it might sound commonplace now, but back then the idea of the filmmaker being both the subject and the author was was very cutting edge. <laughs> And it was made possible because of these smaller video cameras um, and cutting edge super VHS technology. Um, and so I, I was attracted to that idea. And I went in to see this nice man called Bob Long. And before I could finish saying, I want to go back to Haiti to find the man who shot me, he like said, sign here. You know, and this is like the quickest, best commission I've ever had. Um, so this film was where they, you know, they, they give you um, some tapes, um, a few pounds and a camera and send you off because the whole point is that you are going to do this regardless of whether you're filming. And I discovered really quickly that it wasn't a case of thinking about what I was filming. 
um, the whole process of being back in Haiti with a camera in my hand was personally cathartic. And this silly white Western male notion of searching for the guy who nearly killed me was useful as a catalyst to get me out to Haiti. But in truth, the, the real catharsis lay in pouring out all my innermost thoughts, fears and feelings to this super VHS camera. It was like my silent and patient therapist. And um, I understood once when I went to the school where this happened and I, uh, I had this most beautiful experience with all these Haitian kids running up and you know, like laughing and joking with the camera. This blinding flash really of my goodness, this process of telling my story to this small camera had such a cathartic impact on me. If it could do that for me, it could also perhaps do it for other people. And that one realization that night completely unlocked my career as a filmmaker. Um, and it truly has informed all of the 24 films I've made ever since then as I sort of go through my life story. Um, and, 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 you know, story narrative, as I said before, it's, it's literally how we, how we think and structure the world. And I mean, it's like looking at this, this golden thread, which starts in a windowless room in a suburban university, weaves its way through a Ukrainian American woman who took me to the strange land of Haiti, a story that, you know, I fell in love with this place. And then I went back three years later, um, a random fateful intersection of time, place and two bullets um, from a smiling man as he unloaded his machine gun. Um, PTSD, uh, nightmares, and then um, this deeply cathartic process made possible through a few decisions at the BBC and some engineers at a Japanese camera company. Um, that sort of matrix, that coming together of everything, um, led then to a, a whole life of making films at the BBC, the beauty and the privilege of telling other people's stories, um, a reconnection with Nick Cave, who did the music for my first feature, Dr. English Surgeon, um, who was another refugee from those dark St Kilda streets. Um, yeah. Meeting with the wonderful Sripali Patel here of Story Lab 16 years ago, um, which here we are through twists and turns is why I'm talking to all of you now tonight, um, fellow storytellers and, and kindred souls. Um, so that myriad of possibilities that is life, you know, this narrative thread is no more likely or meaningful than any other thread. Um, but what's given my life meaning is telling stories. And I nearly drowned when I was 14. I miraculously survived a motorway pile up when I was 54. But I keep the sweetness of life is, is expressed through telling other people's stories. And, and that's what's given me uh, real meaning to my life. I can, I can say that for sure. So, Jeffrey, you mentioned your film, The English Surgeon, there. And I'm just wondering if you could explain a bit about how the idea of catharsis works in the context of The English Surgeon. This is, for those who haven't seen it, it's obviously the film of, the, of Henry Marsh, the, uh, the English uh, neurosurgeon who travels to the Ukraine. Um, look, many filmmakers, all of us, you know, who've done something with, with uh, observation of films of real life characters, know implicitly that when our contributors tell us their stories, it genuinely helps them deal with life's difficulties and darkness. Um, there has to be a respect between the parties and a moral contract in place, of course. But if those things are there, this resulting relationship between director and contributor can really generate a magic and an intimacy that audiences find utterly compelling. Um, and it's just a good point now to bring in perhaps the first of the two clips from the, the film English Surgeon, which you've mentioned, just to illustrate what I've said about a willingness from a subject, in, in this case, Henry Marsh, to let me as a director into a difficult time in his life and then to journey with me as that story, as his story of confession and honesty becomes cathartic to him and through me becomes cathartic to all of us. Um, it's, it's something that's uh, almost chemical, it's osmosis. I mean, if you, if you distill down what you're actually watching as, a, as an audience when you're watching an observational film, it is the, the relationship between the director and the contributor. Um, we'll talk about that a, a, bit, a bit later. Um, but the context of this clip is um, Henry Marsh, uh, British brain surgeon, goes out to Ukraine every year for, for, on, his own, uh, on his own dime, on his own money, to help a uh, fellow brain surgeon in Kiev with new techniques, as well as some useful equipment that he always brings out with him. On this occasion, 
however, he tells us that he's going for a, a deeper and more personal reason. So let's just see this clip and, and a sense of how a man who I didn't know, uh, probably for not that long before I made this, um, you know, trusts or can trust someone uh, to take us on a journey. Okay, thank you. Let's play the clip on, please. I'm taking out some instruments again for Igor, some old surplus ones, and I'm going to show him some very difficult operations he hasn't really done before. But what I'm thinking most about, actually, is going to see Tanya's mother. And you might say, why, why do I want to go and see the mother of a child who died several years ago? And I've had many patients who have died, um, many of them children. And I, d I didn't quite know the answer. But I just know I want to go and see Katya. I, I think about her and Tanya very often. Um, I suppose because there was so much about hope, and hope, failed hope, really. Um, I can remember so clearly when I first met Tanya. She was very shy, and I remember she still burst into tears when she was first brought into the room. She was very beautiful, um, but she had this lopsided face because half her face was paralysed because of a tumour. How could you see a young girl who was slowly dying from a brain tumour, which in theory is curable because it's not cancerous? How can you do nothing? How can you say, go away and die? You'd say, whatever the risks, whatever the cost, we've got to do something. Hope is more important than anything else in life. And as Katya said to me, you gave us hope, and that's a very precious thing to give. Tanya's tumour was said to be inoperable in Ukraine, so I brought her to London, but things went horribly wrong. During the first operation, Tanya lost her circulating blood volume four times over. It was a, an appalling operation. But it was a second operation when I tried to remove the rest of the tumour where everything went catastrophically wrong. Because of my operations, she had a terrible last two years to her life. She was paralysed, disabled, couldn't really have been much worse. Very powerful stuff. Um, and that's just a, the whole film is, it sets up so many difficult questions for, for many of the people involved. Um, and, but it does so without sentimentality too, which perhaps makes the film more moving for, for that. Um, I just wonder if you might talk a little bit more about the, the sort of nature of, of filmmaking as therapy then, Jeffrey. <laughs> I think what what stood out for me when I met Henry was this, um, a man who was prepared to be vulnerable. Um, you know, he, he's an Oxford-educated brain surgeon, so he, he doesn't <clears throat> he has a healthy ego in in many ways. But he's wise enough to know that being vulnerable and letting us, the public, in and to to his world will both help his profession by by us having much more of an insight into how he works and, and indeed the stresses and strains of, of surgery, um, but also for himself, because this was a real journey of catharsis for him around Katya and Tanya. And I've been told subsequently, there's a recognized psychotherapeutic approach called narrative therapy, um, which is simply based on the patient telling the therapist their story. Um, and that's good to know from a filmmaking point of view, because it really validates what we as storytellers do with our own filmic catharsis. Um, but I do have to say, having made quite a few films with you know, dark, and deep issues, um, at the end of the day, we filmmakers are not trained therapists and we can struggle to, to really hold people as they go through some of this intense personal stuff. I don't know what the answer is because some individuals I've made films with would, would never be able to afford a therapist for the time I've spent with them, nor would they perhaps consider it was even right for them. Um, so filmmaking can fill a gap in some ways. Um, and I think most particularly of, 
of Ralph Bolger, um, who I had the privilege of making a film with back in 2003. Ralph is the father of two-year-old James, uh, who was brutally killed by two 10-year-old boys back in 1993. The case, I'm, perhaps you'll all remember, it, it divided the nation. Um, and Ralph's wife, Denise, was the one the media gravitated to all the time. So Ralph never had his story told. Um, but you might well say, well, you know, why should he want or need to have his story told in public? And, and that's a really good question to, uh, to, to ask because it takes me into the sort of final part of what I want to say. Um, but to get into that meaty subject, um, here's the second concluding clip in, in Henry's story. Um, it's an illustration, I think, of how his confessional honesty with me became very cathartic for him and, and ultimately for all of us. Um, the context to this clip is Henry and Igor have gone to see Kutcher um, all those years later. That's the mother of the young girl, Tanya, who died under Henry's care. Um, they've gone a long way west in, in Ukraine. Kutcher's poor. She spent about a month's wages on a huge amount of food for them. And she's really honored to have the man who at least tried to save her daughter's life back in her own home. Um, Henry wants to sit there. He, and he wants, in a way, to sort of recognize and, and, uh, and feel what he calls the nobility of failure. Uh, and he uses that to reflect on who he is as a person and as a doctor. So that's, that's this, this dinner scene that you're about to see. Do upset, understood. She will drink for, for us, yes. and uh, maybe we should drink for for her family, yes. for Tanya, yes. Misha. Maybe we pay more Tanya than Misha. For your safety. Well, I'll make toast if you'd like to translate, Igor. <coughs> I've been coming to Ukraine now for 15 years. Я живу в Україну, приїжджаю 15 років. And in many ways I've come to love this country as much as my own. Я свою. And Igor and I have been working together for all that time trying to make progress in treating patients with neurosurgical problems. And sometimes we succeed and sometimes we fail. Часто ми дістаємо перемоги, але часто ми і зазнаємо зазнавали поразок. But I'd like to drink to all your future successes and will never stop trying to make things better. Він каже, я хочу випити, за мене хочу випити, щоб що в мене все було добре за за за, за майбутні успіхи. Мистер Маш, I'm touched. I don't know whether I'll be thinking about anything when I die, but the way I see things at the moment, what 
I will think mattered most was how I tried to help Igor and his patients. And I'll think about Tanya and I'll think about Katya. What, what, what are we if, if we don't try to help others? We're nothing, nothing at all. A tremendous work there with both at the dinner scene you know the the how people feel able to express themselves in the dinner scene um and with dr marsh then going to the cemetery now is there anything that you want to sort of say about that clip jeffrey having just watched it again well it's a simple scene um people gather to eat something but um the audience as I said before, is doing most of the work by then. It's the last two scenes in the film. And you're bringing all the things that you've been through yourself in the last 93 minutes. Um, and that's good. I think that's, that's when things like that work well because you're reading into it so much. The audience is reading into it, everything that they've been through. Um, and the scene is just really simple. It plays a lot on, on faces and on reflection. Um, so yeah, uh, and he earns the right to say that question, what are we if we don't help others? We're nothing, nothing at all. If I put that at the front, it, it might sound very presumptuous, but he's earned that right to say that um, by minute 93, given what we've seen him go through. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you've, you've, I mean written, you've written about how documentary makers have a, almost a responsibility. Um, as to having a, a moral contract and a moral compass with their contributors. Could you, could you talk to us a little bit about what you mean by that? Yeah, well, it might sound terribly old fashioned, but I genuinely believe we documentary people have a, we need to have a functioning moral compass and we need to have uh, a strong moral contract with our contributors and with our audience. Um, you know, what do I mean by that? We're all audience members. We know when we have experience something magical when watching a documentary, particularly character-led ones. But as directors, uh, we need to know how does that happen so that we can produce it again, perhaps in the next film. You know, why do we feel something special as an audience? Story and characters, yes, they're extremely important, but I really believe that the alchemy that, that holds those things together is this special relationship between contributor and director. And when that's built on intimacy and trust, it allows the audience to share that same intimacy and trust that that director and contributor have created during the filmmaking process. As I said earlier, that is what you're watching in a character fair documentary, this deep connection between characters and director. That's what you're feeling in every frame. And if that connection's good, if it's based on trust and respect, even love, audience will feel that, will be inspired by that. Um, and, and you got to say, well, why? why, why? I mean, how does that work? Well, I think it works because um, we, the audience, if we're allowed, intimately allowed inside the sort of closed world of another person, it's a profound privilege for all of us. And, and that's why there's something sacred really, or almost sacred about such an experience. It's, it's why character-led docs can be so powerful and compelling and they can generate this very moving on-screen catharsis. I mean, if you look at the landscape of television from a perspective of 2021, there's a lot of truth out there, isn't there? And, um, but perhaps it's a particular kind of truth and Love Island and Married at First Sight. So what's your view of reality television's place in, in this debate? Well, it would, it would be, I really appreciate the people who work on those things, but I, I couldn't do that. Um, uh, they've, you know, they're not given much time and there's so much expectation. So it's certainly not a, a personal uh, uh, slide on anybody, but look, the, the director contributor relationship can be, can be very special, but it can also be the very opposite of that. Um, if that relationship's built on deception or mistrust or schadenfreude or exploitation, then we, the viewers will feel 
something's not right. We may not be able to articulate it, but we will feel morally uneasy, I think, about this intrusion into another person's life. And, and I think recoil from it. Um, I mean, to my mind, reality television is predicated a lot on that sort of the use of people. And uh, it's not good. Um, you know, being allowed to tell someone's story is a real profound privilege. And yet it's also a deep responsibility. I mean, I genuinely think storytelling is really important to the psychic and emotional health of our nation, any nation. And so therefore I, I would describe this contributor director relationship as a moral contract. It's unwritten, it's often unspoken, but like any contract, it depends on trust from both sides. Um, it can be noble or it can be abused, but believe me, I think the audience will know either way. So we, as professionals, we, we have to be aware of why our contributors might want to participate in our films. We have to ask that question of ourselves. Um, you know, we should decide if their motivation for wanting to do so is, is healthy or otherwise. Um, because I think if you do listen to your conscience as a director, you'll know whether, you know, it's in their best interests or indeed our best interests if, if you continue. And just like we should be asking, uh, we should be, sort of playing devil's advocate with ourselves around why we do what we do as directors. Who's going to benefit from this? Why are we doing it? Um, if you can't answer those questions or you don't like your answers, um, you should probably stop because I, in my experience from seeing other people and indeed with one thing I did myself, it can only get worse from then on. So that moral contract, is at the heart of the relationship between director and contributor. Yeah, and it's important and in, in a world which, you know, I might sound old fashioned again, but it, it certainly does look like at places it's lost its moral compass in many ways. This trust is rare and being able to grant that access and intimacy to an audience is a profound gift to make to people. Um, I think just as directors have a moral relationship, a, a contract, so to speak, with their characters, they will have and should have one with their audience as well. Um, if I want to establish a trust with my audience where they believe I'm communicating some sort of higher truth to them about a character or a situation, I need to respect them and to show that respect by putting them at the heart of every decision I make as a filmmaker. Um, you know, that's it's really fundamentally important to me. Maybe it was just all my public service background and in, in, in using public money indeed to make our films but you know the questions that you should keep asking as a director will my audience care about these characters and, and why would they want to watch them you know is it engaging is it clear enough for them to stay involved what's in it for them um, and I've done a lot of work on story archetypes and, 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 and know how to make specific <clears throat> general you know how to access the power of a specific character but make it accessible and resonant for the wider audience because at the beginning of a film they don't care or they don't know about these characters but we've got to yeah. make them as directors we've got to bring that um and i mean uh, this mutual trust and respect i mean if we end with with the uh, the last clip from the english surgeon um this is marion the patient uh, whose story occupies most of the film he's going in right just a minute or two after this clip, he goes into the operation itself where his head will be opened up using only local anaesthetic. Um, and that means he has to have a supreme trust in Henry and Igor. Um, and so that's what's going through our mind as we see this man in this place. Um, we then cut to Henry and Igor preparing for Marion's op and we see how they work out the trust they need to have in each other and, and ultimately in themselves. Okay, thank you, Jeffrey. We're going to play the clip in just a second. Um, after the clip, it's over to you for the questions that you have for Jeffrey, and questions regarding story and um, all of the all of the the art and the craft of filmmaking. Most welcome. We're, we're, on this occasion, we're going to try to steer away from steer away from technical questions, you know, about types of lenses and that sort of thing. But any other questions you. Um, put them into the Q&A section. It would be great to get your questions and hear what you want to ask. So can just play this final clip, please. 
Ну, я, я все так думав, от коли готувався до того дня. Та я всередині так все трясеться. Ну, але, але мушу якось набратися можності і You do realize this is a very big serious case, don't you? The one we're going to do now. Yes, Henry. And the patient. The risky surgery. And the patient realizes. Uh, the problem is uh, that if you run a successful clinic, yeah. so nobody realizes how risky surgery but you, can be. Can I know, be. but you've got to tell them. I mean, I'm, yes, not, I'm not in I told them. I told them. Right. But they reply well, they, they that, uh, like that you had, you, you, you had uh, good results. Uh, we asked many patients, so. We, sh we su suggest that... Yeah, but with simpler, thing. smaller tumours. This yeah, is a yeah. terrible big tumour. Yeah. Mm. You became less enthusiastic with years. Well, no crap! <laughs> it's not that. It's just you're giving me more and more difficult... You're showing me more and more difficult operations. That's the problem. Um, that, that's uh, what it's about. You know, every, every uh, time I you, come, you show me a bloody more dangerous operation. Uh, but you told that uh, we should step by step make make progress. Yeah, but one day we're going to make a step too far. Oops. No, bloody Cossacks. Mm. Ukrainian Cossacks. Yeah. Now that, you know, the die is cast, we're actually going to start the operation. I cheer up a bit, a certain amount of... whether it's bloodlust or training, I'm not quite sure. Surgery isn't just about rational. Altruism. I mean, it's a blood sport in a way. I mean, surgeons have become surgeons for the excitement of it and the sort of fierce joy of operating. So, in that sense, I suppose it is a slightly Cossack activity, you know, sort of brave Ukrainian heroism, things like that. Right, well, off to battle. Possible. Amazing filmmaking. Um, what questions have we got? So um, one question that's come in is, do you ever find your subject matter traumatic rather than cathartic? Does it always give you a better perspective on yourself? Uh, um, <clears throat> Look, when I was in that room filming. I was the third camera on Marion, particularly. Um, and the only thing I can say is that, you know, when you call the fire brigade or the ambulance, if there's a disaster in your life, you don't expect them to start crying when they come out to see you. You know, they've got a job to do. And that job sort of protects people in those roles and professions. They may privately break down afterwards. And I think some people who work in emergency services do that. Um, but just like them, when I'm filming, um, I'm worried about white balance. And is the battery going to last? And have I got the right things in place? And is everything tickety boo? So half of me is not connected in an emotional way with the subject. I, I mean, obviously, I'm very alert and aware of what's going on, but I'm protected to some extent by the job. And that is because those men, Henry, Igor, and Marion, have given me. The, the, the privilege, but also the responsibility to tell their story. So if I screw up because I've not got that one cable in place or the battery runs out, then I'm not doing my job. So you've got to be sort of anal and pedantic about it. And it's a protection. It is actually a protection. I will say in the cutting room, 
you know, you you don't have that protection. You're looking and feeling and really getting involved with people, with, with, with the emotion and sometimes the trauma of it. Um, there's nothing I consciously do to make that gratuitous though. Um, I mean, you know, in an operation about the head surgery, um, particularly when someone's awake, you know, there's a scope for a horror film, but, but we really, really did try all the time to not to do that. It's understated. It's much more about <clears throat> the struggle, Henry's struggle, one man's struggle to do good things. That's what this film is. It's a moral fable. So yeah, the answer is um, yes. I think you can be affected, but thankfully not usually at the time because you've got a job to do, which saves you from that. There's, just leading on from that, there's another question um, which regarding the film, which is, did you feel there was a danger of celebrating the English surgeon as an individual genius hero type of character? And if so, how did you avoid that pitfall? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I would say uh, Henry's extremely aware that this, you know, he struggles with the notion that these people who were in that waiting room think of him as this great white savior from abroad who's going to fix all their problems. Um, and he can't sometimes, there's limits to what he can do um, because of the nature of the tumor and all the rest of it. Um, but he, he was not interested in that, nor was I interested in any way to sort of celebrate that sort of cliche of the, the surgeon and the great white savior. I mean, from the outset, this is a film about a man confronting failure. It's the nobility of failure. That's what he wanted to do. And that's very, very much what I wanted to do. Um, so if you see the film, you'll certainly realize that it's the antithesis of um, celebrating <clears throat> the sort of, you know, the, 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 the general, the war that surgeons are often depicted as playing in the media. Um, nothing could be further from the truth, you know. Henry was 57 when we shot this. He looks like 75 because he carries a huge moral responsibility for, for his work. Um, you know, because if something goes wrong with a brain operation, you can destroy that person's personality. Uh, we can all live without an arm and a leg, but uh, we don't want our personalities changed. And that's what he struggles with because sometimes it happens. Thank you. Um, in the comments, someone has, um, John has said that um, it's not a question as such, but he really respects the fact that the trust between director and contributor allows the contributor to express him or herself more clearly. Yeah, um, I, it's not, it's not, none of us are making films, hopefully, to, to hear our own voices. We want to hear what other people have to say. And um, as I said before, Henry allowed me in to a sort of vulnerable, tricky, difficult part of his life. And, and that's why we all love him. That's why we love characters who led us into their flawed world because we, are, we carry around those same flaws and those same doubts and those same vulnerabilities. Henry, Henry's great as well because he, he, you know, he makes me roar with laughter sometimes as well. Just how he phrases things, you know, that he says at some point to the to the to the person who's having, you know, the operation that to have a pulse rate of seventy while you're lying there having your head sawn off is quite something. <laughs> it's just sort of he delivers it so matter of a factly, but it's so it's kind of dry black humor. Very very much so. And I mean, he says just before the operation starts, he says, you know, he says. Um, he go, hospitals are like prisons, he says. Um, a small number of people are doing nasty things to a large number of people. And it's so true. I mean, and, but it's a brilliant observation. And he's, he's full of um, interest in everything from hospital architecture to you know, how people get better to um, windows to a courtyard so that patients can heal faster and noise. And he, he just, he's dedicated to people getting better because um you know the moment he said some he got older and he the wheels started falling off his own body as he describes it he you know he was even more of a compassionate individual um and a real maverick at that um we have a question here 
from Judy, which is why do people agree to be a subject? And I guess there's lots of answers to that, depending on, on who they are. But it, as she says, it's so personal. So I just wonder if you might answer that. Um, and, all, and, and as a follow up, she asks, do you keep in contact with your subjects after filming? Yeah, look, I'm some of my best friends are people who I've made. Um, uh, I would say just the best people are usually reluctant to be contributors because, you know, the landscape of modern media and television is not that appealing. I mean, it's sort of, you know, it's sensational or schadenfreude or, you know, the, the, it, it doesn't appeal to people with a, a sensibility. But um, if you spend some real time with people and explain, as I did with Henry, you know, why I think he, he, he and his world is so important and interesting, um, you usually find common ground. Um, and that is why once you get to a point where the contributor can trust you, and I always say to people, you will see the film before it goes out. And if there's anything that really does not work, we will sit down and, and work it out. So they, they've got some safety net, um, but usually to the point where I want them to be emotionally invested in the process. I want them, and Henry was very, very much like that, you know, to be active in the process because then, you know, people are really keen and they're opening up and they're not going to sort of put on a face or a facade or anything else. Um, you know, his driver was wanting the public to understand what it's like to be a surgeon. It's, it's not some celebration of him or an inquiry into the NHS or the expose of the Ukrainian health system. No, no, no. It's, it's a moral fable about what it's like to carry that moral responsibility. And that's what he wanted to communicate. And I wanted to communicate the same thing. So that's why we could come together and it was a marriage made in heaven, really. Okay, thank you. Um, can I just ask you, moving to the father's story, can I just ask you how, what happened between you and Ralph Bolger before you filmed? I mean, what, how did you establish that trust? Because if you haven't seen the film, Ralph Bolger does appear very relaxed in the film, but very, he's very open, searingly open. And he's clearly comfortable with the filmmaker. So how, how did you get to that point? Um, Ralph's brother came to Ralph's brother came to their lawyer, I think, was expressing Ralph's brother's desire that Ralph had not told his story and it was killing him. Ten years later, Ralph was still traumatized and was not in a good way. And so Jimmy said, Is there anyone that can tell Ralph's story? And my exec said, Yeah, I think Jeffrey would would be a good person to do that. Um, I went up to see him. I struggled with the Scouse, you know, accent. And I said to myself, look, I've got to put my money in this budget into time rather than sort of a crew. Um, so I did the filming and the recording and everything else. And some of it's a bit ropey, to be honest. But um, that was a decision because I needed to spend time with Ralph. And we, we went fishing largely for two months just so that he could look at my eyes. He knew where I was coming from. And I said, well, I don't want to talk about what we're going to make the film about. I do not want to talk about that. I want to talk about everything else. I want to talk about football and fishing and, you know, what it's like to be living up where he was living. And so we, we really did have a, a, a friendship, a relationship built on time, um, just time. Um, eventually I got the camera out. I set it up outside where we, where, where we, we used to go fishing. Um, and I gave him the camera and I said, you look through this, you know, you try to demystify this strange device put it on the tripod and we just sort of went back to what we would normally do. But at this time I said, tell me what it's like to be Ralph Bolger. And no Hollywood script could deliver uh, the, the power and the wording and the pacing. He just, even the way he said things, let alone what he said, was just, just like gobsmackingly good um, because it was a man who was being listened to for the first time, you know, in his words, no one else's. Uh, so if you put the time in and, you know, I was told Ralph was inarticulate and he was a thug and he wouldn't talk and all this crap. 
no, 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 that's not true at all. Um, there's this beautiful soul in there that hated himself for hating the boys who killed his own son. You know, he, he, he struggled so much with that and he poured himself out and there's some brilliant interchanges with him and the priest who was around when it all happened and who we travel to, to see in Ireland. And um, I'm immensely proud of that film because of how Ralph was at the end. I mean, it wasn't easy. He, he wanted to pull out several times because it was too intense and, and the rest of it. But Jimmy and I just kept reminding ourselves that the power of narrative therapy, as I said before, when someone tells you their story, that was what pulled him back. He knew it was good for him. He, he had enough, um, he had changed enough to understand that it was really worth going through this. Um, so I'm very proud of it, even if no one had seen the film, that have done something really good. Um, the, 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 those scenes between, the, there's a priest um, who, who conducted the Bulger, James Bulger's funeral, and in, many years later, um, Ralph goes to visit the priest who's now living in Cork in the south of Ireland and they, they, they have a conversation in the priest's house um, and the priest asks Ralph a series of questions and it's an astonishing sequence and it might last what, seven, eight minutes. It's got incredible power and, and all you're looking at is the face of Ralph and the face of the priest yeah. as they exchange thoughts. Yeah. I mean, I think that's what audiences want. We want to engage in morality. We want depth and struggle. You know, we want to see how other people work it out because it helps us work things out. Um, to me, it's not rocket science. I mean, it's hard enough making a film, but why then don't we, you know, why, why not take people into a place where they can feel things and, and profoundly question themselves, the world around them and their relationships. There's a question here, Jeffrey, regarding the, what you did regarding cameras and recording sound in the operating rooms for the English surgeon. And I suppose that does relate in, in some senses to story and narrative, doesn't it? How, how, how did you approach the, the, in the consulting room, um, uh, which is an intense place, a lot of the film takes place in this small room where Henry and Igor sit and people come and go and come and go. And there's some, some pretty harrowing things said in there. Um, so I, I was shooting the patients and I tucked myself behind a sort of bookcase to be out of the way as much as possible. And Graham, my good cameraman, was behind the patients shooting over their shoulder towards Henry and Igor. And we, we wanted two cameras so that we didn't have one person moving around and distracting patients from what can be, you know, very serious conversations. So out of respect for them, we, we shot it like that. And I also had a microphone on a pulley in the ceiling, which would be lowered by the sound recorders who was sort of hidden in a wardrobe <laughs> around the corner so that when people uh, sat down, we could mic them properly by dropping the microphone. And when they got up, uh, to avoid them hitting their head on it, we would, uh, the sound recorders would sort of pull it up. Um, so these were just things to make that feel seamless. And, you know, the beauty of a small shoot, it was all done in 13 days, that film. Um, the beauty of a small shoot is you can put resources into the shoot and you can sort of set it up so that it feels seamless, you know. And there was a camera in the, in the, in the corridor because there's a whole world of things going on in the corridor as people wait for their turn to come in and, and see the doctors. Um, so I like that idea of, of multi-cameras and coverage and um, you know being able to cut it like a drama. Really. What about the impact of your films? As you know, you've made a lot of films and are they, are they, are they, do they come and go in their own time or do, does documentary have the, does it have the power to have make it make a changeable impact well when you know uh, when there was only four three five channels <laughs> to watch here in the BB, uh, in the uk you know you would hear people talking about your film the morning after on the bus or something that's wonderful um uh inside story we would get you know five million people sometimes watching your film informing a national sort of conversation it's fantastic feeling um uh 
I remember showing the English surgeon in cinemas and having people queuing up to talk to Henry and pouring out you know, all sorts of profoundly personal things to him because they'd been moved to do that by a cinema experience. Um, and Presume Guilty, a uh, film in Mexico, uh, changed the law, was a, was a spearhead of a campaign that fundamentally altered a Mexican society because it, hitherto it had um, presumption of guilt as a guiding legal principle, but that was changed through the film, through one 90 minute piece of cinema um, into presumption of innocence in 2015, like four or five years after the film went out. And that really means a lot to me because tens of thousands of young Mexican men, have their lives have been changed because of that. Um, and that's the power of what one film can do. Um, we should all remember that, you know, it, it's, it's, it's exhilarating, it's incredible. Um, the government tried to ban it in Mexico, but of course more people went out to see it. And in the end, it was in 330 cinemas as a 35 mil print. Um, incredible. I mean, that was just through wow. the best distribution company, uh, you know, in Latin America as well, the most commercial one. Um, but it was a hit because it was structured as a moral drama. Okay, Jeffrey, we could listen to you all day, but unfortunately, we are at the end of our time. So a huge thank you to you. Thank you so much for coming here and, and, uh, and giving us such wonderful uh, experiences and tips and sharing your, some of your life as a filmmaker with us. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you audience for, 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 for coming today. Um, if, you, if, you, if you enjoyed the session, do please consider joining RTS East so that they can put on more of this kind of educational type events. So go and have a look at their website for that. Thank you for Story Lab at Anglia Ruskin University for making sure everything in this session happened. And we look forward to seeing you um, all again very soon. <laughs>